Great, excellent. Well, let's get started. Uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for taking the time to attend today's training. I'm Stephanie Dahlberg, here with the Beer Positive Support of the New Hampshire DHHS. I'm also the co-chair of the Balance of State Continuum of Care Community Medical Subcommittee. The Balance of State Continuum of Care is sponsoring and hosting the training series on free intervention, along with the continued communication and collaboration with Greater Nashua and Manchester Continuum of Care. I'm here today to receive community-wide training on diversion practices within the coordinated entry system. This training was developed and will be presented by the Technical Assistance Collaborative. Today's training will be an overview of what diversion is and how it plays into the coordinated entry. We appreciate you taking the time to be here with us. And um, I am putting in the chat the login. I'm seeing someone wrote in, it's difficult to hear. Um, I am almost done with the intro, so hopefully you can hear that better. And with that, I'll pass it over to Doug and I'll continue sending in the chat. Thank you. Great, hey, thank you, Stephanie. Um, and welcome everybody. Uh, let me know actually if we can get either some nods, I'll look at the cameras quick or in the chat if, if my voice is coming in a little clearer. Folks hear me okay, thumbs up. So see some nods, thank you. All right, well, I'm gonna assume we're good. Um, so my name is Doug Tatro. I'm with the Technical Assistance Collaborative. A uh, number of you or most of you may have been on previous uh, trainings that we've had uh, in these sessions. Um, we appreciate you all coming today uh, for this, I believe, third iteration of these sessions that we've had over the last couple of months. We know uh, and I appreciate how busy folks are uh, amongst your normal jobs. And now we have Omicron surges and we have January in New Hampshire and there's a lot going on. Uh, and uh, uh, taking 90 minutes of your day to attend this um, uh, is difficult. So I really appreciate that. This will be primarily didactic, though we'll have some time for questions in the chat and if folks wanna unmute a little bit later, but we are looking to uh, really just provide a general overview and level set of uh, some key concepts related to our topic today. Um, and we are also recording uh, this training and uh, we'll distribute the slides and the recording link uh, in the next couple of days once those get processed in the, in the Zoom um, uh, template. So for introductions, please fill out the Google form. The link is being added uh, uh, in the chat uh, that uh, demonstrates that you have attended this session. You're also welcome and, and encouraged to use the chat to communicate with me or Stephanie or the other partners from the state or each other uh, throughout the meeting. I will try to find some pause times, uh, certainly at the end, to take a look at what questions may be arising uh, or feedback may be arising as well. Uh, so we'll, we'll try to uh, keep folks as engaged as we can and hopefully uh, in the future uh, uh, where I'm involved, be able to have more conversations with you all uh, rather than just uh, hearing Doug uh, talk for a while. So I work for an organization called the Technical Assistance Collaborative. Uh, we are a, a nonprofit organization, but we operate as a, a consulting and training firm um, hired by communities and by state and local and federal uh, agencies to um, support uh, efforts related to homelessness, affordable housing, uh, and people with disabilities. Uh, we're based in Boston, but I am New Hampshire uh, born and raised, and I currently live in Manchester. So while I do work in communities across the country, I'm always happy uh, to be able to connect with folks uh, here uh, literally in my neighborhood. Um, so today's topic is called housing problem solving, and we're going to weave together a number of concepts related to kind of that big picture concept as we go along here. But overall, you can see the agenda that we have uh, for uh, today. Uh, a brief overview of what housing problem solving is, including some distinctions among key terms and uh, definitions, how problem solving uh, is um, embedded or can be embedded into core entry processes and systems, and some general practice considerations. Um, today, uh, this uh, presentation will focus on um, themes that are constant or, con or sort of universal uh, with sort of any COC or um, group of folks that are working to end homelessness, um, but there are going to be over time a lot of, I think, implications and uh, um, more reinforcement on how these types of practices will be uh, embedded into uh, the three COCs, coordinate entry processes and access points uh, within the state of New Hampshire. And uh, there'll be more to come on some of those, and I'll allow uh, others from the state and the COC leads to, to offer any um, more on that uh, for today. But uh, we're going to talk about some of these concepts uh, more, more generally. So 
let me see if I can. So what I'm going to do is first launch just a very quick poll just to get a sense of the room. Um, and what we're asking you to tell us is what is your level of comfort with the concept of housing problem solving? Uh, is this something that you're very familiar with? You feel like you could run this training, you're a pro, I could use some practice, um, I've heard the term, but have a general sense, or um, this is a brand new term to you. So I, I've got this open uh, and I'll let give folks another 10 seconds or so to respond. Um, you can see that, so I will uh, read the results to you in a moment. So go ahead and fill out that poll. What's your level of familiarity? This is an anonymous poll, so if you are completely unsure of what I'm talking about so far, uh, feel free to indicate so, and uh, uh, no one will know it's you. So we're going to give it five more seconds. Oh, 12 folks haven't responded yet. Okay, I'm seeing buttons. Ellen mentioned she couldn't see the poll, but it looks like others are seeing it. I'm not sure. Yeah. There may be another window, Ellen, that opened on your computer. Um, uh, those of us that might be on a mobile device, make sure you hit the more button down at the bottom. You'll see a red bubble and then you some, can select poll uh, near, near the chat option. We'll just give it another second. This is a good, uh, just a quick indicator. So I'm gonna go ahead and close that now. So what do we have, um, and I'm not sure if you can see this, but uh, of the folks that responded, we've got about nine of you that feel like you're a pro with this, uh, 16, about 27% that could use some practice, but have uh, you're getting there, you have some ideas on it. Another 40% of you who have a general sense of what the term is, and a few of you, about 15% or eight folks uh, that don't know what the term is, and that's perfect. So what we're gonna try to do is uh, further folks' knowledge that have a sense of what I'm talking about with housing problem solving and also offer that introductory baseline foundation for those of you who uh, are questioning whether you're in the right training today. Um, but this is a term that is relatively new um, and it is, in, it is intertwined with other terms which we're gonna talk about those distinctions today. Um, so uh, it's an easy thing to, uh, to need further clarity on. Um, so before we jump in, I wanna just remind all of us sort of why we're here. And as we go through the training, uh, you'll see that a lot of what we're gonna talk about with problem solving has to do with uh, centering the clients and the human beings that are looking for assistance uh, in empowering those human beings to help us guide uh, their exit or uh, prevent their entry into homelessness. And one of the things that I think we often forget uh, when working with folks for the first time is the, the sheer amount of stress involved in someone becoming homeless or, or having a housing crisis. So just for about 30 seconds here, um, I want everyone on the call, uh, and, and feel free to close your eyes um, or, or you know, go off camera if you'd like. Uh, we do this uh, exercise in person and I always find it to be really valuable. Think about a time in your own life, personal or professional, it could have been yesterday or 10 years ago, that it was a very difficult situation that was really important to you where you may have felt out of control and that problem persisted for more than a month or for a prolonged period of time. And think about how you felt and acted um, during this stressful, difficult situation that you were in in either your personal or professional life. And so I'm gonna just pause uh, for about 15 seconds and just let folks muddle that in their own minds. You won't need to share out. Um, but think about that. Think about your own life and one of these really difficult situations that you may have faced and how that made you feel and act uh, in, in, in your life. One of the things, and this will be your only neuroscience lesson of the day, um, that we know about stress is that it literally rewires the way in which our brains function. Many of you uh, who participated in that exercise silently probably remember feeling anxious or confused or tired or irritable, or maybe you had a couple of extra glasses of wine that month because of the stress that was on your shoulders, or maybe you were having more difficulty managing relationships at work or with your family, or maybe you are becoming forgetful. 
uh, that is, uh, those are clear signs of the way in which our brain adjusts uh, going back to, you know, the, the, the very beginning of our human brains in our fight or flight um, responses. And when we are feeling good, uh, our ability to provide executive function coming out of our pre uh, prefrontal cortex uh, allows us to navigate the challenges and the options and the uh, potential barriers that we have in our lives with much more uh, finesse and, uh, and and a much more I'm going to mute somebody um, with much more of a sort of coherent strategy. Now, when we are under high levels of stress, particularly when we are under stress for long periods of time, uh, that brain function, those connections that allow us to navigate those things change into other parts of our brain uh, that you can see here. Um, and, and literally, it makes us less capable or incapable of performing certain functions. Um, the reason this is important is because stress, as we all know from our personal lives, and I'm sure many of you know from your professional life, I, either internally within your organization and teams or with the clients that you face, um, uh, directly affects the ability for people to solve problems, to modify behavior, to follow through with plans, to override some of the more impulsive behaviors and emotions that we may have, to set goals uh, uh, and try to actually direct ourselves toward them. Um, the stress of housing crises and homelessness and the prolonged stress of poverty and the other factors that lead to homelessness have that effect uh, not only on us and, and the folks on this call, many of whom may have had housing insecurity in the past, some of whom are, uh, may be in poverty or have that now, some of whom have not, but work with clients who have. We have to always be trying to uh, remind ourselves and reinforce to ourselves that the folks that we're working with who are coming in on what is the worst day or week or month of their life have this tremendous amount of stress uh, on their shoulders uh, uh, due to that situation they're in. So as we talk about housing problem solving, one of the uh, rehumanizing aspects of this concept is to work with people to reduce or de-escalate the stress uh, overload that may be in their, um, in, their, in their lives at the time. And we talk about this uh, not only in terms of how we empower people to help us navigate them toward a better housing situation, but also in things like how many of us, including myself, misdiagnose uh, mental health issues with what is really a stress overload symptom or may bring our unconscious biases into the workplace or recognizing that there are certain populations such as Black, Indigenous, or people of color, BIPOC, or LGBTQ populations or young people who are disproportionately affected by trauma have long-term exposures to stress, and then that then manifests into behaviors and actions that uh, may not lead to the results that we all hope. And so as we're, we're going through this very basic foundational workshop or training today for the next hour or so, and as we move forward in these concepts, uh, we always wanna reroute ourselves in the human experience of the folks that we're trying to support. Um, and, and I think it's important we start with that whenever we talk about practices that connect people together. And one of the key features of this housing problem solving practice is uh, being able to de-escalate and rehumanize uh, the connection between uh, folks who are in a crisis and those folks like yourselves who have the capacity to help them navigate away from that crisis. And understanding um, how those stressful environments uh, uh, play into whether or not somebody is empowered or able to help navigate toward a better solution helps us then respond in a way that, that doesn't cause further stress, but in fact de-escalates those, those, those trigger symptoms and helps people reground in their problem solving capabilities. So when we talk about housing problem solving, we will talk about this as a system, uh, both a system and practice level response, but it is also a response that tries to uh, work with folks in a way that helps them navigate uh, some of their own housing solutions. So in context, um, you may have heard all sorts of different uh, terms around housing problem solving, things like prevention and diversion, rapid resolution is a VA term, progressive engagement. Um, uh, we're going to kind of demystify some of these terms, but uh, our concept of housing problem solving really tries to root us in with a blanket sort of set of ideas that then apply to different types of interventions or time frames for those interventions that we see in our community. Before we can define that, uh, really important to acknowledge some, some base realities that we face right now. 
Um, and we've done this in previous trainings, maybe with other, other contexts. Uh, and this first check mark is one that I brought up a number of times when we talked about coordinated entry a month or two ago. And that right now in every community in this country and New Hampshire's three COCs are no different. There are more people who need housing assistance than we have housing assistance to provide. Now, we may have in this country all the money we need, and I would argue we do, to invest in systems, in, in bricks and mortar, in services that can help people end or prevent their homelessness writ large. But right now, uh, your system, the control that we have within our homeless crisis response system does not have all of the assistance that we have uh, that we need to provide for anybody seeking that assistance. For those who will become homeless, those who have become homeless, we all know that those lists of folks uh, that we cannot help are often longer than the list of folks that we can help. And so what we want to be able to acknowledge is that part of our job, not only enrolling people in projects and trying to figure out how much rental assistance they need, but really uh, that we need to empower uh, the folks that we're here to support to help us end their homelessness. And sometimes, <clears throat> excuse me, sometimes that comes in ways that have not been as conventional. So I don't believe we're ever gonna end homelessness with one bedroom and studio apartments. I don't think it's possible. I think that if uh, that is the goal, then we will never achieve that goal. I also uh, uh, believe that uh, reconnection to family and friends and natural support uh, systems is a critical aspect to our work. This is true for people who have uh, mental health challenges, who have substance use uh, uh, disorders, who are homeless, and looking for uh, uh, needing assistance and needing that, that support network. Um, it may not be true uh, that everybody and or even most people have those natural or community support systems in place to help them navigate away from a housing crisis and back into more stability. But it is also true that many folks that we work with will not receive any other type of assistance from us and so we have to look for creative ways to make those in, uh, reconnections and find ways that we can help people navigate away from that current situation that they're in into something more stable as quickly as we can. And oftentimes we see that services are uh, de-emphasized in, um, uh, in, in sort of deferring to financial assistance. And of course, people need help paying rent. Um, there was a, a report that just came out last week that uh, further demonstrated that rental mar markets are tightening and they're getting more expensive. Fewer and fewer people who are uh, considered low or extremely low income or on fixed incomes can afford a one bedroom apartment or an SRO on their own. So financial assistance is always important, but the capacity for you all and your teams to provide services that help de-escalate and navigate folks uh, back into some other uh, housing situation is critically important. So we have to be able to emphasize uh, how uh, we balance the need for our budgets and our investments to go towards financial assistance and bricks and mortar uh, to also being able to be those key linkages for people across different systems and different connections. Um, that said, there will always be people or there will be for some time, hopefully not always because our job is to make it so always doesn't happen, but um, there will be people who will not gain access to housing without deeper support, both in terms of clinical uh, focused uh, support as well as deep subsidies uh, that, that will likely be enduring long-term or even permanent. And so within that, these realities, we recognize that there's a spectrum of outcomes, of um, inputs, of folk situations that we have to be able to work through if we're gonna end homelessness for all folks. Um, uh, with our most, uh, you know, uh, with our deepest subsidies and most uh, uh, intense resources going to those for whom there's no other option or resource that will be available to them. And so what is housing problem solving? For the 14% for the of you who hadn't heard of it before, um, it is a blanket term. And I'll read this slide. There's some other dense slides that I'm not going to read, but I'm going to read this slide. Um, strategies and services that assist households to use their strengths, support networks, and community resources to find safe, decent, and appropriate housing as soon as possible outside of the homeless crisis response system, even if temporarily. They, they should be used with everyone interacting with the homeless service system often more than once and over time and as conditions change. And it's a core set of strategies that features, uh, 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 that can be employed at all different points uh, in our engagement from your access points for those of you who are doing street outreach or have walk-in centers to those of you who are trying to coordinate housing plans for recently enrolled 
uh, rapid rehousing clients, to those of you who are supporting people who are uh, prioritized for permanent supportive housing. This is a, a way of rehumanizing uh, our work uh, and uh, perhaps in some places moving away from some of the old paradigm of how we would uh, work with people in the front end of engagement, um, you know, sign these forms, we'll find you a bed, we're gonna get your data, uh, to something that actually relies on human creative conversations, interaction and trust and, and works with people to identify solutions that may not be the bread and butter one bedroom apartment subsidy that many of us uh, strive for and many of us have been successful with for a long time. And in recognizing the realities that we had on the previous slide, we know we need other options for folks and other ways to help people navigate. So we hey, focus Doug. on empowering, yes. Sorry, um, I wasn't sure if you were trying to share your slides yet or not. If you were just doing an intro and then showing your slides, I know you had a few ready for today. Um, I was, but some. Here we go. I apologize for that. So um, just for folks, and I don't know why that would have happened, but uh, just for folks, I, the realities I, I just read, um, this definition that I read is on this slide here, and you're going to get these slides, and then now we're on uh, the defining further. Uh, everything else was just uh, indicators for um, our stress our stress opening. Um, what we're trying to do is really focus on empowering persons that are experiencing a housing crisis to help them regain control of their own situations and lives. Again, thinking back to the stress uh, and, and cr of crisis and the lack of control people have uh, when our brains are literally being rewired uh, to, to sort of fight or to flight, and, and we don't have control over the way in which decisions are made or the way in which we can navigate. And it recognizes that homelessness is a crisis and that if we can help people de-escalate that crisis by uh, listening and validating those experiences, by approaching things in a non judgment manner, we center the client in our work uh, by not bringing our own assumptions to the table, uh, uh, we are able then to uh, create a partnership with our clients and the folks who are in a housing crisis that allow us to together help navigate toward some other solution. And this is the first step in what we call a progressive approach, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. But these are, um, again, probably looking for, at the slides now that you can see them, and I apologize, you couldn't for a few minutes. Um, these uh, concepts uh, are probably still fairly nebulous and fairly sort of all over the place in terms of, okay, we're trying to deescalate, we're empowering people. And part of that uh, is true in that housing problem solving is not defined by three or four eligible activities in a COC grant. Um, housing problem solving is a way in which we interact with human beings uh, that allow those human beings and, and empower those human beings to have control over their own lives, where our services and the interventions that we're offering are reflective of the desires and the goals of the client and not the other way around. Many programs across this country, and I'm, I would venture to guess some of the ones on the call right now, uh, do a better job at creating program designs and rules and um, expectations that meet the needs of the program versus actually meeting the needs of the client. And so this idea of problem solving is flipping that switch to try to recenter ourselves around what those clients need, what those folks in, in crisis really need and want, and being able to adjust what we can do to support them, recognizing that even if somebody may need or want a long-term assistance or subsidy, that not being immediately available means we have to find some other way, uh, some other common balance way and safe way uh, to not have them living on the street or in shelter or in dangerous situations, at least in the immediate moment. So here's sort of a, a side by side juxtaposition. So before, you know, uh, the question would be, are you willing to enter shelter? Can we find you a motel? Can we get you a bed? Uh, now we shift that focus. What can we do today to keep you from becoming or remaining homeless, even if for today? And part of this concept is that there may not always be permanency in the solutions that we are trying to navigate, but what we can do is relieve the, the immediate crisis and give people some breathing room uh, in order for them to help navigate uh, toward a more stable situation. The majority of people who become homeless in this country in a given year self-resolve their homelessness within 45 days. If we can help people self-resolve their homelessness in one day or two days or not experience it uh, two days from now, we're then uh, 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 cutting out the trauma and the ill effect and the longer term impact that that homeless experience has on people, particularly on families with children as well, 
Um, and we're able to then uh, shift that narrative from trying to pull people in to uh, homelessness and, and into trying to help people not become homeless at all. So rather than, you know, what are we eligible for and how are we going to get you enrolled and here's your paperwork, we want to hear what would resolve your housing crisis. Uh, uh, instead of just immediately assessing people for all their vulnerabilities and asking them to, div to divulge all of the negative things about their lives, we want to brainstorm and, and, and have these conversations with households that really try to understand what it is they need and how we can support a crisis resolution to avoid shelter entry or at least end it for a period of time. Again, that resolution may not be permanent, but at least we're continuing to reduce the number of days, the length of time, the amount of trauma that somebody in a housing crisis or at least homeless housing crisis is experiencing. So this is the paradigm shift. And this shift has been happening for a number of years. So HUD has published uh, some things on housing problem solving. My VA and SSDF friends on the, on the call uh, call it by rapid resolution, which is a, a, a certain set of services. Um, but it's a shift in perspective, and I think it's a shift in how we operate, especially in outreach and intake and walk-in settings, where we, of course, are always going to work our hardest to make sure people are safe tonight. And if there are no, no, no other alternatives, then we will make sure that people are, don't need to be outside, that they can, they can be kept warm, that there's a bed available. And I know that's a challenge in of itself. But where we can find ways to help people navigate to some other option, um, even if a bit uncomfortable, but still safe and is not in that sort of crisis uh, setting, uh, then we're able to um, uh, continue to work with them, either supporting them and, and, and they, they are able to then resolve because they, they stay with family or friends for a few weeks and they get back on their feet and they're, they're off and running, or now they have that relationship they've built with, built with the system or with you as a provider to then know where their, alter, where their options are, know where they can find assistance moving forward, but trying to shift our narrative from completing checklists and forms to really trying to focus in on what are the needs um, that, that the client has, what are the assets they have to them. So not why are you homeless today, but you've been housed for 10 years. How did you make that work even when you were still facing poverty, right? So it's part of what I talked about in our coordinated entry training, focused on this idea of phased assessment, right? Uh, an assessment does not need to be a checklist or a form. Now you will have checklists and forms as part of assessment and there's new uh, coordinated entry assessments that are being approved and have been reviewed by many of you within the COCs over the last number of weeks. Um, and there will be a place for that. But this uh, concept is the place where we're trying to connect to human beings as human beings and understand what are their goals, what are the opportunities and assets that exist within their lives and how can we help them leverage and navigate those opportunities in a way that is productive toward their housing goals, while also realizing that if we don't do that, we either, uh, they either remain uh, in homelessness until a bed is available. For some, of, for some of these folks, that could be years before a PSH slot or even a rapid rehousing slot opens up, um, or, to, um, uh, uh, or they're able to self-resolve, but again, they're experiencing that trauma uh, during the period while they're, they're on the street. So housing problem solving fits into a number of different places and it sort of recognizes the, this, this um, resource reality that I mentioned, that the number of people who are going to receive intense PSH support from you all and from the continuums within the state of New Hampshire is very small. The number of people who are gonna receive rapid rehousing assistance is bigger than permanent supportive housing assistance, but it certainly isn't everybody. So there's this whole cohort of individuals and families out there for whom rapid rehousing assistance and particularly permanent supportive housing assistance is not gonna be available at any time in the near to medium term future. And so what do we do? We have uh, our options are to allow um, those folks to uh, remain on the street or in their cars or in hotels that they're trying to pay for uh, to, to continue um, disruption in their employment or their mental health or their child's education. Um, or uh, for some of those folks, we may be able to help navigate some solutions, some ways that they can reconnect uh, with family or friends, ways that we can mediate with their landlord to come up with repayment plans before they get evicted, ways in which we can identify people who may be willing to live together um, uh, as roommates or in shared housing where uh, alone, they cannot afford to exit homelessness on their own, and they're not going to be connected to other assistance or at least deep level assistance. But, but if you get two, two people that know each other, who've stayed together in the shelter or knew each other prior to or whatever it might be, 
Their combined income allows them uh, to rent a two bedroom apartment. Uh, we're now expanding that housing stock with those two bedroom apartments because we're not so focused on one bedroom apartments. There's a myriad of creative ways that we can help people resolve these problems. There's some other key terms that I want to touch on, though, before we get into some of sort of the, the mechanics of this. These are probably terms that uh, many of you have heard diversion, rapid exit, homelessness prevention, rapid resolution. Uh, I, I put this slide in here in its entirety uh, so that uh, folks would have reference to it. I'm not going to read it to you. But in a general sense, when we talk about these terms, diversion is when we're able to help people who are seeking, actively seeking assistance. They're looking for a bed. They're in crisis. They don't know where to go. They're in their car. Um, they were evicted yesterday or kicked out of mom's house yesterday or foster care. Um, move them out when they're 18 years old, and they are looking for a, a crisis bed, a hotel, motel, an emergency shelter, a warming station. They're looking for help. Um, and we, a diversion is an outcome or a point in time when we're trying to help those folks avoid having to enter that shelter situation um, uh, and instead find some other safe option. And I'm going to continue to use the word safe because this is not an absence or denial of services. It is trying to use a different type of service toward a different outcome uh, that still remains safe and appropriate for that given household and based on their choices. But diversion, we think of as prior to the shelter entry, right as they're looking for crisis uh, uh, support. And we're trying to help them navigate towards something else. Rapid exit is the other side of the shelter door. This is uh, trying to use these creative strategies, typically without a deep subsidy or a lot of financial assistance, to help people move away from their homeless situation and back into some other safe appropriate, even if temporary housing option uh, in the community or with their social networks, family or friends, or maybe where they came from before. Uh, but rapid exit and diversion are um, of sort of outcomes on two sides of when somebody by HUD's definition, for instance, becomes literally homeless. Homelessness prevention is further upstream. That is when somebody is facing uh, the potential to become homeless within 15 or 20 or 30 days. And we are intervening at that point in time, uh, trying to find a way to make sure that that doesn't happen. In some cases, that is mediation with the landlord, uh, trying to come up with payment plans or other ways that we can do that, perhaps some financial assistance. Uh, in other cases, it is helping people navigate to another housing option before that housing option they're in now uh, is no longer available to them. And then rapid resolution is sort of a com combination of a, mo a number of these terms that is specific to the SSVF program. Uh, it's a term that the VA created to encompass both diversion and rapid exit type uh, outcomes. So essentially, all of these um, outcomes or points in time rely on the use of creative housing problem solving conversations. And the distinction between them is really about when we're able to help somebody resolve that crisis. Is it before they become homeless, uh, but they're at the crisis door? Is it further upstream when they're anticipating uh, facing homelessness in the near future? Or is it when they've already become homeless and we're trying to navigate them uh, toward a safe option, even with uh, very little uh, financial resources uh, where, where it's not available? So the reason I've, I put this really dense slide up is for folks to reference. But oftentimes, I think in our work, we're going to refer to these interchangeably, and that's fine. Um, we don't really care as much as what you call it, but we, we think it's important that you understand how we've made these distinctions. Um, these distinctions are published in right now in a VA tool. They also closely align with HUD's definitions of diversion and prevention. Um, and they also generally align with the National Alliance and homelessness uh, use of these terms. And so we're trying to weave together some vocabulary here that all interrelate, but also have some important distinctions. And so you might run a, pro a project uh, that you call a diversion program, and you are welcome to call it a diversion program. In my vocabulary, I don't think of diversion as a program. I think of it as a set of strategies that lead to an outcome that helps people avoid becoming literally homeless tonight, right? So those are nuanced distinctions. Uh, many of you may not care about these distinctions, but I think they're important to have noted and important to have um, on, on slides. Um, all kind of speaks to the fact that these sort of creative, uh, mediated, uh, 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 sort of de-escalating uh, approaches um, are system-wide. Whether somebody is uh, anticipates becoming homeless in three weeks and we're using our skill set to try to mediate uh, a better outcome with the landlord, a, a repayment plan, and then a referral over to an employment uh, support program that allows folks to increase their income, or whether that's somebody who recently uh, entered shelter with no other option, they're in shelter and realizing um, 
you know, uh, the, uh, I, they come in and they're, they, they're expressing that there's nowhere else to go. Uh, but within a couple of days, the, the argument they had with their, with their partner or their spouse or, or they're recognizing that, you know what, it might be worth trying to talk to my brother across town or across the state because he may be able to take me in because this shelter situation is not what I want to be a uh, part of. Uh, idea of problem solving approaches applies to all points in the system. So it happens at that first point of contact. And, and many of you will see over the coming months with your coordinate entry process, we're actually trying to build breathing room into that first point of contact. So you all have some time to connect with people before you start putting uh, vulnerability indexes in front of them and asking them how long they've been an alcoholic, right? We're trying to build in the breathing room for, for providers and for the system to connect with humans as humans and look for ways in which we can um, uh, leverage essentially their strengths in a way that helps them navigate toward other solutions um, other, than, other than being uh, uh, homeless, right? So the other reality that we face with this is that if we can be on the front end of folks who are coming in for crisis, the more we can reduce the inflow and the backlog pressure on the scarce resources on the other side of, of the coin. So many of you are working with uh, people who have, uh, who, who you think need permanent supportive housing. And the reality you may see is that those folks are not gonna get permanent supportive housing anytime in the near future. And so their option is going to be either uh, to stay in shelter on the streets or in encampments uh, while they wait, uh, hopefully for their name to move up the list based on the vulnerability of other folks and the relationship that their vulnerability and prioritization um, rests with uh, other folks that are looking for assistance or um, uh, where possible, and again, it won't be possible uh, with all folks and it might only be possible 10 or 15%, but where possible, what else, uh, what other options exist? And so, you know, I think about um, that there's someone appropriate for, for diversion or for problem solving. And I think there's gonna be a slide on this in a minute, so I might get ahead of myself, but the, um, you know, I, I have a family member who has um, uh, a severe mental illness. Uh, uh, he is, has schizophrenia and he would uh, quite easily elevate to um, a PSH prioritization if he were to go through the court entry process here in New Hampshire. Um, just because that statement is true does not mean that the other part of his story is also true in that he is able uh, to uh, live with another family member. Uh, he pays that family member a modest amount monthly to live there and he contributes to the household. And that family member is perfectly willing and fine uh, having him stay uh, in the house and to be supporting him until uh, and if he moves on to his own place or maybe gets a long-term voucher somewhere or, you know, uh, or something like that. So both of those statements can be true. Somebody may have a, 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 a significant number of vulnerabilities that would lead us to thinking that they need uh, permanent supportive housing, um, but also have uh, natural family or social or, or community supports around them that can keep them out of the homeless crisis response system, reduce that person's name or, or story on our, on our by name list and in our, in our overall queue for housing. And somebody is uh, unmuted, so I'm gonna find you and mute you. All set, fine. Um, or, thanks, Stephanie. Um, uh, so that we can make sure that those who don't have those all, other alternatives are the ones that are going toward the more scarce resources. And I understand this is not uh, one size fits all. It's not, uh, uh, it's utopian to think that all of the people who are uh, in a housing crisis uh, in our state and our COCs are gonna have these alternative options. I understand and we understand that many folks have already burned those bridges. Uh, like my family member hadn't, hasn't burned that bridge. And if he, and if he did, I don't, you know, maybe he would end up in the system. But part of our, uh, our reality is that if we don't have enough for everyone, we have to find ways to reduce that backlog pressure on these scarce resources and make sure that those scarce resources are going to those who have no other alternative. I think similarly for um, uh, a really um, uh, just terrible trend we're seeing right now in this country around older people, uh, elderly people who are uh, becoming homeless and because uh, they're getting priced out of rental markets because their fixed incomes are not rising fast enough uh, with, the, with rents. Uh, landlords are not re-upping leases. And now you have 60, 70, 80 year old folks that are facing uh, a homelessness and may not have other options. Well, you know, they may have family willing to take them in while they are put on uh, a, a list for vouchers for 
you know, non-disabled elders or disabled elders, right? So there's all these other options that may or may not exist, but we don't know whether those options exist or not unless we explore them. And when somebody is in the stress of homelessness, the ex expectation that they're going to explore those options and be able to find fruit with those options uh, without our assistance, without our support, without the empowerment that we can bring as a community, as systems, as individual practitioners and human beings and empathetic uh, uh, direct service case managers and outreach staff, um, uh, it, it's an unrealistic expectation that folks in that type of stress during a pandemic in the middle of winter in January um, are going to be able to navigate their own um, uh, options and assets and, and opportunities without the assistance that we have to provide in that service structure. So I think it's important that we frame this as a continuum of time within our system and that housing problem solving, I'm actually going to skip this, applies to all of these different parts. So from the left side of the screen, we start with people who are engaging with community settings. Uh, we see that we're going along. There's this effort uh, to divert them, to try to prevent them from becoming homeless. Um, some of those folks will be engaged with street outreach. Other will show up at shelter. Other will be recognized in the, in the school system. Uh, we're unable to divert them. We're bringing them into this coordinated entry process and making sure that there's an emergency shelter or emergency housing available to them. And then we are looking for what is the natural and available next step. Uh, that may be a rapid rehousing enrollment where we're providing um, you know, short to medium term assistance with services. It could be that they're going to be uh, targeted toward permanent supportive housing. But all along the way, we are continuing to use this sort of strange term problem solving or housing problem solving. We're continuing to have conversations with the client, with the household about how we can support them in helping them to navigate towards something uh, that is not being literally homeless, even if we cannot support them with, say, a long-term voucher or PSH slot at this time. And the conditions under which, uh, or the conditions in someone's life may change over time. So just because our diversion effort failed doesn't mean that a few weeks later or months later or years later that there couldn't be other options uh, that, that come up. You may have somebody who has been living in, in a tent for a number of years, uh, is willing to uh, try to uh, work their way into housing um, uh, and not work by earn, but to get into housing, but still can't afford it and is not being prioritized currently for what we have available. But now they've met a couple of people uh, in their in their community, in, the, in their in their sphere of uh, or social life, um, uh, whether those folks are, are in encampments or, or not or, or in housing or family. And now they have this other support system they didn't have when we first talked to them six months ago. And maybe we can help them leverage that support system uh, to get them into housing. And maybe that also means we're getting some other folks back into housing or we're helping some other folks who are in housing who could use the financial help from a rent paying roommate. Um, to keep that housing. And so we, we are uh, recognizing that not all of these outcomes are going to be um, you know, comfortable or ideal, but they may not be in homelessness. And so you know, I think what this chart does is it just it tries to reinforce that um, while diversion and, pr and prevention and, and rapid exit are point in time outcomes, the notion of using problem solving skill sets, which we're not going to get into today, we, we, we do full day trainings with direct practitioners on that. Um, but uh, uh, using these skill sets, these de escalation techniques, this motivational interviewing, this mediation uh, work, this ability to connect with family members and navigate and, and negotiate ways in which um, uh, families and, and social networks can support each other, um, uh, we use those at every point. This is just what we do. We don't say, okay, we're going to have our housing problem solving conversation now, and then we're going to move on to your enrollment. We're, this is just a new or, or perhaps not new to you way of, of doing business. And for many of you, this may be the thing that you're already doing and we're calling it by another name. But part of the effort in New Hampshire and in many communities across the country is to memorialize and is to uh, uh, sort of document that we are uh, active practitioners in this type of work, that we're not relying only on checklists to understand people's needs. We're relying on human beings to help understand human being needs, and that that can happen at any point in somebody's crisis experience. So some of these example outcomes, and these are just very sort of simple uh, ways, but somebody is coming in. Um, uh, some of those outcomes may be, may be that they're going to go back uh, with family or friends uh, long term. Um, you know, I was actually uh, working with a community uh, in Florida recently, and they were telling me a story about a veteran who 
uh, got into um, uh, not a physical, but just a, a disagreement with their spouse. Um, spouse kicked them out. Uh, I don't know the details on why that happened, but kicked them out, didn't know where to go. Spent a couple nights in shelter. We're working with this. And the, and the service provider was able to help um, sort of have a, a, a mediate, a reconnection with that veteran, with their spouse, but also connect them uh, to a, a basic referral, didn't require any money, a basic referral to some family mediation services, right? So, so that person might probably would have ended up going back home um, at some point, but we expedited that process because there was somebody willing to connect with them, willing to make that phone call or bring, or, you know, bring them over, sit down, have a conversation, and then make that referral uh, over to a basic community resource that was available to them for further support. Uh, we also may see people that are new housing or relocating permanently uh, to another safe place. Uh, and then where we don't uh, 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 divert somebody, we may um, uh, see them going uh, further down our court and entry process. They're, they're moving along in this phase assessment approach and we're able to um, uh, continue to support them in the ways that we are right now is to the best of our ability with safety and then longer term housing options. So we may see a successful path where there's a point of contact with an outreach team or at a shelter, uh, they are, uh, they go to uh, maybe they come into shelter for a day or two or even none, and we're able to reconnect them with family or friends. The person recognizes that they have family members across town or across the state. We help uh, navigate that reconnection to that family member, negotiate perhaps uh, a way in which uh, that person may be able to stay with the family member for uh, either a defined or undefined period of time. What would those expectations look like? Are there some commitments folks can make? Uh, perhaps the family member uh, taking them in uh, is fine with them coming, but they can't, uh, you know, use alcohol in the house or they need to be uh, respectful of, of the children in the house or there may be other negotiations that need to happen. Again, you know, we do full day trainings on those things. Um, and many of you, I'm sure, have done this before. But essentially, uh, that reconnection and then that follow up uh, where we have the resources to do so. I think the important thing about this slide is that, one, many of this, uh, will look unsuccessful. Many people won't be diverted. Many people won't be rapidly exited. There are going to be a number of people that are going to continue to be in encampments and in our shelters and that we're going to be pulling our hair out trying to connect to a housing resource. However, arguing and the, and the, the providers that I've worked with in different parts of the country that have done this really well have recognized that even when somebody can't be diverted or rapidly resolved or we can't um, find an alternative for them other than through our more formal resources, we are still creating a, a different type of relationship with our clients that instills trust, that instills communication, that empowers them from the minute they engage with us, rather than disempowering them and asking them what went wrong to make them homeless, fill out this form so we can get you a bed, where we're, we're immediately validating uh, uh, their humanity, uh, their strengths and their assets, and building a relationship that will continue into whatever comes next. And so when it comes down to that rapid rehousing referral or that permanent supportive housing or connecting with an EHV voucher or an SSVF program, we are now um, from the very beginning put the uh, uh, control in the hands of the client and allow that trust to build between our system or our program and the people we're trying to support and that trust then manifests into better housing outcomes long term. So we're not telling people what to do anymore. We're not telling them to sober up so they can get in our programs. And I'm gonna say out loud, cause I think I'm allowed to, if you're running a program out there that requires people to be clean, sober and medicated, then um, I think there's a lot of discussion to be had about whether or not those programs are, uh, are effective in ending homelessness, right? So we're not dictating our programs to people or our system. We are working to empower people to help us uh, navigate them uh, within the confines that we have with our resources. So there's some core principles here, um, and I've gone over these um, around uh, focusing on that empowerment, that listening. Uh, a little later, right before the end of this, I'll, I'll mention a couple things on staffing, because you also need to be able to orient staff, not only in having the skill sets, but the time to do this. People need time to sit down with, a, you know, I guess pre or post COVID times or whatever, but with a cup of coffee and connect with human beings um, uh, on, on that human level. Uh, and that's a skill set. Um, but we kind of come at this with some of our core principles, one of which is really approaching everything from a strength based approach. Um, most of the people who we encounter and, and who need our help have been told what's wrong with them for long periods of time or for their whole life or for this past week or whatever it is. 
And our job is to make sure that we are acknowledging and, and standing up the strengths of clients uh, as they're coming in for help, recognizing not that they're in a crisis now, but perhaps that they weren't in a crisis last week. So what worked then? Not recognizing uh, that uh, or, or immediately going toward the fact that they need to um, go to recovery, but looking for ways that they've been able to navigate their addictions um, uh, uh, safely in the past, right? So thinking about that strength-based approach, which is, again, a staff skill set um, that we, we really want to be promoting throughout the state and as program managers and directors on the line. We also want to make sure that we are uh, continuing to build our equity practice. And that means hiring staff that reflect the people being served, uh, both in terms of their um, you know, age and their, their race, their ethnicity, their uh, gender identity, all of these different um, elements that make people who they are, that they uh, uh, may feel um, discrimination for. Uh, it's very difficult for us to say, uh, it, you know, for me, for Doug, who's, you know, a middle, middle-aged white guy, um, there may be uh, folks that I'm simply not going to be a good resource for in the community because they may not trust or be able to connect with my life experience. So thinking about how we build equity practices from our hiring processes to how we include and uh, value the input from other groups, um, uh, uh, in, in, in our decision-making process and how we orient ourselves, being able to change staffing so that if you have a, a, a female who has had uh, sexual trauma or um, uh, is a victim of domestic violence, that the people that we're connecting that female to are not going to re-traumatize uh, her in um, our pursuit of trying to help uh, with, her, with her housing uh, crisis, thinking about where we're not going. Um, is not a particularly diverse state, um, but we do know that disproportionately uh, BIPOC populations in particular uh, 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 are overrepresented in our homeless systems. And that means that we're missing something in both in how we assist people, but also in how we outreach to them before they become homeless, how we make our services known before somebody falls into crisis, and how we support those families uh, uh, once they're in crisis. So thinking about how we adjust our practices to be more equitable. This is also part of the work that we've been doing with the state and the other COCs around um, uh, court entry assessment tools and things like that, and there'll be more to come there. Um, uh, and then really infusing these core principles that many of you have heard of, housing first, crisis response, choice, progressive assistance, and community resources. So, you know, housing first, and, and really in, in, in some of this context, uh, uh, ensuring that there are low barrier options for people who need immediate crisis support. We are not looking to limit um, the types of housing supports that are available to people. We're not looking to deny people services. We're not looking to say, uh, you, if you can't be diverted or, or if you uh, have your family member across town, if you don't go to them, then we're not going to um, uh, help you. Our focus is on making sure that the balance between the resources we have available and the people who need those resources is as balanced as possible. And right now it's completely unbalanced. And so uh, problem solving is a housing first approach and that we are continuing to pursue housing for everybody regardless of the barriers that they face or the barriers that we perceive of them facing and making sure that our efforts are not being limited by that. Making sure that just because somebody uh, uh, is, uh, has no income or, or no income or uh, is actively using substances or uh, has a criminal history that we're not uh, pushing them away from services. And in fact, as many of you have seen in the new court and entry tools that have been worked on over the last number of months, we're, we're actively and proactively pulling people with those more significant barriers into the longer term supports because it is those people who need those longer term supports the most. So problem solving, um, there's been criticism uh, early on that it was a denial of services. And, and what I wanna reinforce is that it's not a denial of service. And in fact, it is, it is part of a housing first system approach that continues to focus everything we do on moving people toward permanent uh, or, or long-term housing and recognizing that um, uh, uh, folks may have other goals or challenges in their lives that we're not gonna be able to fix, but we can focus on their housing. It also is, as I said before, again, the core principles, uh, a crisis resolution approach where we're de-escalating that stress, that emotional um, uh, uh, you know, stress on folks' lives and trying to work with them to define uh, ways and steps that we can take with them as a partner in this 
uh, toward helping them regain control over their lives and ultimately their housing situation. That then rests on that client choice, uh, making sure that the goals that the client has and the choices and preferences are respected. Um, there should be um, uh, the ability for someone to say no, even though they have family members in one place, um, they may not want to go to that place and that is perfectly fine. We do not want to create unsafe situations. We do not want to create other pursuits um, that are not agreeable to the client. Um, also, uh, seeing the chat light up a little bit, Stephanie, so pause me after this if, it's, if I should respond. Um, we're also grounding this in this idea of progressive assistance where people's needs, we recognize people's needs change over time, that cookie cutter services uh, will not work, and that oftentimes we have to start with a lighter touch service package before we're able to offer something more in depth or, or deeper or more intense. And where we can offer that lighter service package is within this context of problem solving, mediation, and navigation toward other options. And then where those other options, where that navigation uh, either doesn't exist or fails, uh, we continue to work toward those, those more uh, um, uh, deeper subsidy or longer term service packages that are associated, say with PSH or rapid rehousing. I put this slide in here um, uh, just as a reference for a future reading. I'm sure everybody will be excited to read it. Um, but essentially, when we talk about this idea of progressive assistance, we're recognizing that uh, it's nearly impossible to predict the level of assistance a household may need to end their homelessness. There may be some people with significant vulnerabilities or perceived vulnerabilities for whom there are options for them to exit or, or avoid homelessness altogether with very little support there may be people who on a vulnerability assessment look like they uh, won't need much, but in fact, they need a, a much deeper service package in order to stabilize. And so progressive assistance uh, uh, basically promotes the idea that we start with an as need light touch service package. And then as those service packages prove not to be enough for that particular client or situation, we escalate our services to a deeper level of service over time um, to, so we can find the right balance and preserve those deeper resources for those, uh, to those, for, for those who uh, really do need them. And, and maybe needing them is the wrong term. There are a lot of people who need our support, but whether or not it's available is another discussion. So we wanna preserve those who may need them most or, or be most susceptible to either permanent uh, homelessness or death or, or injury or uh, further trauma uh, should they remain homeless. And then finally, this coordination with community resources. Uh, uh, you know, and I actually think, you know, in what I've seen in New Hampshire, this has done really well in the state compared to some other states that I've worked in. But we need to be able to know what are all of those uh, different resources that are not connected to homelessness, like that family mediation example from the veteran in Florida. What else is in our community that just support people in the community or people perhaps in poverty in the community or, or people with children in the community, whatever it may be. How do we make sure that we have a pretty good idea of what's available and then where we can recognize that those types of, of mainstream community based resources and, and support systems can be leveraged or be referred to to be able to move people toward those and, and not necessarily assume we have to pull people into our services to provide support when we may have natural support systems outside of the finite homeless resources that we can control. Uh, I'm going to stop for a second. Stephanie, is there anything. Um, that I need to talk about in chat, or should I keep going? Uh, we have just one question, and I let Susan know we could address it later, but I'm happy to read it off right now if you'd rather address it now. Um, I think it could. Yeah, let's do it now, and that'll give me a chance to have a sip of water. Sure. I'll look at it. Um, so um, Susan says, I feel like there are a lot of programs out there for the ones that are able to find an apartment, but what about the ones that we could get them in to stay with family if there was some financial assistance for that? Yeah. So um, that's a great question, Susan. There's a couple of, uh, this is where I think we have to figure out how, um, sometimes we have to figure out what our funding allows us to do and doesn't. Uh, so for SSVF, on the VA side, there's an example of this where um, with certain commitments from, well, I'll call it a host family. I don't love that term, but uh, they, you know, don't hate me for it. Just a host family, a family member will take somebody in, uh, but they need that financial assistance. Um, in SSDF, uh, for the VA programs, there is the capacity to provide some limited uh, financial assistance to veterans and their families when the family makes a certain commitment of, uh, of time the veteran can stay with them. 
uh, and that also results in enrollment in the program for further support later. Um, in other communities, um, maybe uh, other ways to get around that. So for instance, uh, in ESG and COC rapid rehousing, you can't provide financial assistance if somebody is not on a lease, but if somebody was homeless, enrolled in one of those projects, and then is able to navigate back to a family member and is added to their lease, there could be financial assistance in, in that type of a, a setup. There's also a lot of communities um, that are uh, looking for either federal or state flexible funds. And I, I would defer to the state partners on this because I don't know the current status of this in New Hampshire, um, where they do have sort of dedicated, uh, they call them diversion resources, but you know, problem solving resources that uh, are more flexible in nature and say could uh, pay uh, you know, mom, uh, a couple hundred dollars a month for a few months, uh, while, while, you know, uh, uh, Doug, you know, lives with mom. Uh, and then there's the mediation piece that I think is probably more, um, it's, it's probably harder to do, but it's probably more prevalent just given the resource constraints. And that is where if, if I have uh, some income, the provider could work with me and my mom to come up with, uh, an agreement about me contributing into the household, right? So maybe, I'm, I'm receiving um, uh, either you know, disability income or I've got a job and I'm gonna contribute X dollars a month uh, toward the household's needs. And there's an agreement, a mediated agreement, perhaps in some cases between me and my mom, uh, uh, kind of facilitated by a, a service provider or a referral place that says, okay, here are the consequences. If this doesn't happen, here's, you know, here's what it does. It does. So there are some federal and state funds in the, in the world that support financial assistance uh, for folks that are not uh, going into a lease, uh, other financial assistance packages that may be required require that lease, and then some of it is uh, flex funds or more of those creative uh, pieces. Um, in Cleveland, Ohio, where the Cleveland Mediation Center is, which was sort of one of the early pioneers of this type of work, they didn't call it this at the time, but even back in the early 2000s, um, they were uh, doing some data runs and uh, they recognized that um, by training their staff in these types of concepts, they were able to breed better outcomes in terms of diversion efforts, uh, often without financial assistance. And they were seeing, and I don't want to, I'm not going to, I'll, I'll misquote, but generally they were seeing uh, 20 to 30% of those households that were looking for a shelter bed or coming into a drop-in center for, for help were able to be diverted. And very, very few of those households required much financial assistance, if at all. And, and they, they have credited uh, their staff, their training and the way in which they've sort of instilled and embedded this concept in this way, this sort of mode of operating within their community. Um, and they've embedded that over time, they've practiced it, they work together, they have uh, role playing internally uh, around how you might help navigate people in different situations. Um, so financial assistance is of course important, uh, but it may not always be critical. Um, and I'm, yeah, and I'm seeing a little bit more on that. I'm gonna continue and we'll come back to that. I wanna get through the slides, <coughs> excuse me. <clears throat> um, and I only have a couple slides left just to say that out loud. I, I was hoping to leave more time for the chat. So as you are um, uh, seeing these, just these last couple, please uh, add things into the chat. And I would also, given we've got about 20 minutes left, welcome anybody to come on uh, onto the, to the phone. So I mentioned earlier that one of the things, so we do um, uh, multi-day trainings on this. And one of the things that is clear is that type of work can happen without training and support and really taking a look at the kind of the day-to-day -day life of your projects and especially those outreach intake and shelter projects and how they interact with clients. And I wanna just pause a moment and say that while I'm sort of, uh, like new way of thinking. It's not a new way of thinking for one. Uh, many of you are already doing this. And two, um, pending uh, that, you know, the day-to-day -day life of shelter staff has all sorts of extra time at hand to go have a cup of coffee with somebody to dig into their personal histories and get to know them and, and create this like deep human experience, right? These are, these are very difficult times we're in, both with COVID, with the lack of resources uh, uh, for, um, you know, at the shelter level. We have a lot of people coming in, you know, right now it's, I mean, I live in Manchester, it's what, you know, 20 degrees outside. There's a lot of emergency problems happening at the moment. And so uh, the idea that we're just gonna reallocate staff time away from data entry and into this idea of kind of this mediated, empowered kind of conflict de-escalation um, modality, uh, I understand to be 
um, sort of utopian, but I think we can do it over time. And one of the things that we look at at different systems is how do you staff this? How do you, who do you train to do this work really well? Because it takes training and practice to do it really well. Um, I, for one, would not be particularly good at this uh, directly with clients. I, I am not as patient as uh, others might need to be to do this really effectively in the world. So I, while I, I've studied and understand uh, programs and communities and people and systems that do this really well, if you put me with a client, I, I don't think that I would succeed in this job or this role. And I think that's important to recognize is that this job or this role may look different for the future than it looks like right now. And that requires that training and that support. And it also requires decisions. Do we, do we train every person who's gonna engage with people who are on the street or in shelter uh, in these types of um, uh, uh, skills? Um, or do we train a couple of people and have more specialists? Or do we do both? Do we have specialists that also support people, right? Um, in, in how they do that, right? So there's different ways to think about that. I think generally speaking, given the number of assessment points there are in the state of New Hampshire, uh, a broad-based training uh, regimen is probably more appropriate because you're going to have a lot of people engaging with other people. And so get, making sure that you have uh, the capacity um, across those assessors to be able to provide this, this type of service or, or to approach their service in this way is really important. And that will be embedded into that coordinated entry process. Um, so as we, we look at um, specialization, thinking about the ways in which uh, we use um, the limited professional development time we have, our hiring strategies combined with those equity strategies that I mentioned earlier in terms of who we hire uh, is really important. Um, one of the things that we discovered when we rolled out the SSVF rapid resolution work, which, which I was part of the team that built that a couple of years ago, um, uh, was that um, former clients, uh, folks that had been homeless, had been through the system, were now in housing, uh, were some of the best rapid resolution or diversion or problem solving specialists that we could find because there was an immediate intimate connection between their life experience and the life experience of the folks who they were working with. So before <clears throat> this past year or two, when so much focus has been on equity, and we've learned through that focus that part of our equity focus and our commitment to equity is hiring people who uh, look like and have had similar experiences to the people that we're trying to assist, that then gravitates toward hiring former clients or people who have had lived experience in homelessness. Not only hiring them, but frankly, helping them design our programs because they're the ones who know best on how our programs fail them. Um, uh, uh, you know, looking for ways that we can position staff uh, either, you know, in any combination of this, whether everybody's trained or you've got specialists or inflow points where you want to pilot this, maybe in your community, uh, you know, you're covering an entire county or part of the state uh, or, or RAP, I guess it is, uh, regional access point. And maybe there's all sorts of places where folks are first engaged. But what you want to do is say, okay, you know, in Nashua, this is the particular shelter or location where we're seeing the most inflow for the people who we really need to connect with the most. We're going to put our specialists, our time, our effort, our, our problem solving skills to the test in this place first. And we're going to allow that then to branch out into the broader community. That decision for Nashua or for Manchester will look different than up in, up, you know, way up north or in, you know, Laconia or in Portsmouth or in um, Greenfield or wherever uh, we are in Londonderry, right? Because homelessness is in every town in the, in the state, despite um, what maybe some of your mayors and city councilors believe. And so um, thinking about your own organization and your position within this broader goal of ending homelessness and your staff, you know, are there folks in your team who on this call that really would, would benefit from like a deeper kind of dive into these concepts? And you know, we don't have a, a direct service training set up right now or anything. There's a lot of resources out there on this, some of which are webinar formats, some are reading format. There's some um, uh, learning management system work that's happening for the VA side that we're working on that can help people build those skill sets and allow them to infuse this not so much as, okay, now you're a problem solving person, but this is just how we do business. We don't approach people as checklists. We don't just immediately tell people to go find a bed. What we do is make sure they're safe for the moment but we try to engage with people and we try to get more creative or as creative as we can be about connecting people back into housing. Uh, and just to repeat what I said at the very beginning, we are not going to end homelessness with one bedroom apartments. We are not going to end homelessness with everybody living by themselves. 
we are not going to end homelessness by giving everybody a PSH slot. So our options are we either only end homelessness for those for whom we can connect to uh, one bedroom apartment or PSH slot or maybe a rapid rehousing enrollment, uh, and then everybody else lingers until we can get to them. Or we find ways to infuse more creative strategies, more nuanced strategies, uh, uh, more uh, in some state, some cases, uh, harder strategies, right? You know, roommates and sh shared housing are not easy, right? Connecting people who've never lived together before to live together is not easy. We see that in college dorms all the time, right? Um, but most people live with other people. Uh, I live with someone, uh, she happens to be my wife, but without our combined income, we wouldn't live, live where we live. And that's the reality of our housing market. If we wanna fix our housing market and we wanna go build housing, then that's a uh, admirable role we have or need we have in this country, but that's not the role that many of you play. Many of you do not have that mission in your mission statement, the money to do that. What we do have is we have really dedicated uh, 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 people, right? The people power within our organizations to find more creative options uh, that can support uh, clients and folks who are in crisis, helping them de-escalate that, re-empowering their lives because so much uh, about homelessness is, is disempowering, right? It's pushing people down, it's going toward the negative, bringing back the assets and opportunities that people have in their lives, cultivating those assets and opportunities and helping people navigate toward them. And that requires skills, that requires training, it requires uh, support, it requires management support, it requires our, our ability to look at our physical spaces and our virtual spaces in a way that allows for those types of conversations and creative decisions to unfold. And, and it means that we're never going to be perfect and that our endeavor to end homelessness is only perfect when there is no more uh, homelessness. And until that time, we want to make sure that the, the, the good we can do, the better we can do uh, slowly, one client at a time if need be, if only 10% of the people that we engage in the strategy, uh, if we engage everybody that we see in the strategy, only 10% uh, are actually diverted or their homeless crisis is ended earlier. Some may call that a failure by most HMIS systems. You see 10% success in something, it's a failure. I would call that uh, a, a great success because that's 10 fewer people with 10% fewer people who are on the street tonight, who are struggling tonight, who may die tonight uh, due to their homeless situation. So uh, it's something for future consideration. Um, and I, I somehow found it uh, uh, well to end where I was hoping to, to leave about 15 minutes of time for either uh, uh, questions or comments in the chat. Um, and I'm just gonna open that up now and pause a moment. And then Stephanie or others from the state who have been part of this effort, if there's anything you'd like to add, uh, would, would welcome uh, anything that you have. Right, I'm getting a few um, comments in the chat sent privately that I just wanted to, it reminded me a good opportunity to just um, voice that, you know, we understand and support you all during these times. You know, the, the pandemic has really complicated a lot of our efforts and programming and has put a lot of stress under everyone. I think Doug when you opened at the beginning to you know, think of a time when you've been very stressed out and in that kind of mode. Um, you hit the nail on the head for a lot of us, you know, during the pandemic has been one of those very stressful times. And uh, that does not go unnoticed here. And we appreciate all the hard work that everybody is doing. Um, and know that, you know, this training and conversation, and the, the whole series is meant to be um, supportive, nothing punitive. And um, again, you know, we, we see the hard work going on. I think Everyone here is doing a really great job already with these conversations, and I think it's still important that we have these ongoing conversations and reminders of what some of this work looks like, and um, we're here to support you as much as we can. So I just wanted to add that. And I did want to mention there was a question in the chat about um, a follow-up survey after this training. Doug, I know we haven't done any um, follow-up surveys yet after the first two sessions we've done, but I'm happy to put one together following this session just to hear any feedback or um, you know other asks or questions. Yeah, we're I mean we're happy to put one together if you all want. Um, also happy to take feedback you know, directly, if that's, if that's the purpose of the survey, um, you know, you could send uh, myself or Stephanie or throw it privately in the chat. Um, and just to reinforce, uh, I know I've mentioned a couple of things around 
you know what we are and are not doing um uh you know i i am acutely aware of how difficult everything is right now and how hard your teams are working and i would venture to guess that a lot of what we just reviewed uh, are things that you've already been doing or that have been strained because of COVID, or maybe you did it because of COVID and there was no other option to help people navigate and we're, what we're doing is putting words around that and trying to trying to create a common sort of set of uh, foundational understanding for everybody uh, to to explore these types of ideas. Um, but there are hard realities uh, moving forward in terms of uh, the lack of affordable housing that we have or or uh, in the lack of units that are out there, um, the the income to rent gap is continuing to grow. And so the part of this you know training and some of the comments that I made, it's really about just reinforcing the need for this creativity in order for us to be able to accomplish the mission of ending homelessness because I don't see how we do it otherwise. and and that has not that does not imply then that, uh, folks aren't creative or that you're not working hard or anything like that. So just want to clarify that. I didn't see any of the private chats, but just for, um, you know, my own, my own reference. There weren't any other questions in the chat. Um, again, I think Doug already mentioned, but you're welcome to come off mute if you have anything you want to ask or add. Um, and the chat is open for anyone who wants to utilize that function. Well, I would welcome and encourage other folks' feedback um, or questions. Um, uh, like I said, you know, we, we weren't getting too much specific into New Hampshire's core entry process, but some of the elements of what we just reviewed are continuing to be embedded into the, the actual systems that are being designed and redesigned and reworked, um, both from the, um, you know, the prevention and diversion tool that's out there now to some of the changes to the coordinated entry assessment. Um, there will be a continued deliberate effort to capture uh, or to promote these types of practices um, throughout the state. And I think uh, this is sort of the introduction to that and there's more to come. And, and, uh, and you know, let's see. Um, so Jim, you asked, will we review the checklist at some point? So there are uh, problem solving piece, um, uh, that is more the conversation, but there is the coordinated assessment tools that have been, I believe, voted in by the three COCs that are uh, now being prepared for distribution and training. Uh, that's maybe what you're re referring to, Jim. Um, I'll let Stephanie expand on the timing for that. I think there are still some schedules to be worked out in terms of that rollout, but I'll defer to you, Stephanie. Yes, we're going to do the, the full um, training that was on the schedule. Uh, we just need to get those back on the schedule. Uh, Doug and I had to revisit the training schedule due to the timeline with ICA and the new HMIS system rolling out and all of that. Um, so we will be reviewing the assessments and that whole process and the actual tools and the upcoming training. Um, hopefully we'll know by the end of this week what the schedule will be. I'll send it up to everyone like we've been doing. Well, um, I really appreciate all of you coming today. Uh, we'll end a couple minutes early here, which is cool. Uh, let us know any other feedback you have. And um, again, you know, I, I work in different parts of the country and I'm always really honored to be working in my home state, hometown. Um, I am a New Hampshire kid and uh, raising my kids here now, which is exciting. And uh, it's nice to be connected with folks that are, that are local. So um, really appreciate your work. Um, I see it every day uh, in my own life here and um, I know um, all of you have been uh, impacted just like, you know, everybody has with, with COVID and with the affordable housing crisis. So really appreciate your time. I look forward to reconnecting with many of you in the future, either in these types of engagements or hopefully things that are a little bit more conversational. And uh, Stephanie, I don't know if you have anything uh, last you want to say, but we can uh, close out. Thank you, Doug, for putting this together and running it. And thank you, everyone, for attending. We'll see you soon.